No one really leverages their people very well. People hire when a majority of their team is only doing 20, 30% of the work they could do. And so the more with info product that you can create systems that essentially get people to calls where they're already like, hey, I want to pay you. I just, I, don't, I didn't know how, or I just had a couple questions. Of course. you need, the easier it is. I know a lot of info products and they pop up, they make a bunch of cash yeah. and then they're gone in a year, two years, three years, right? So how do you consistently stay relevant? Number one is, Welcome back to the Wealthy Business Podcast. I'm your host, Javi Chavez. Today, I have somebody who's a marketing genius, has been part of, you know, well, you know, <laughs> I have somebody who's, you know, grown and scaled a lot of very well-known info products and businesses and pretty well connected. And even before the podcast, he's been super knowledgeable. Paul, how you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Dude, so good. So I guess, you know, you were the kind of give me your bio a little bit before yeah. I quick little bur- background. Yeah. Background stuff is so boring, right? Um, started in car sales when I was a kid, got into government stuff, uh, got into software. Software is where I started to learn a little bit about yeah. the online space, had a friend that got me into it and then had a sales consulting business. That was, you know, your first, like first mm-hmm. business you ever have, nothing special. Started in an agency, had a really messy year with an agency, but ended up selling it, which was also super mm-hmm. messy after 14 months. And then that kind of, all that learning experience of, of trial and error and learn and, and just messing up for 14 yeah. months in the online space gave me enough experience and authority, if you will, to start working with some of the bigger brands in the space, C-suite leadership teams and such. Uh, so spent the last two years working with guys like Brian Page, uh, Iman Gadji, Joel Kaplan, mm-hmm. et cetera. Nice. So for the last two years, you're with Iman, right? Yes. And then tell me about that experience and you know what, I'm sure there's a lot you could say, <laughs> but uh, tell me about some of like the biggest challenges that you guys encountered over the last year. Uh, in general, it's it's the same as when you deal with any big content driven business that mm-hmm. has, you know, it's almost like a content machine that has a business on the back end. Yeah. Uh, most businesses, kind of like we were talking about with you, you learn the business side first and then you you grow content to, to, to give that more leverage. Mm-hmm. But the, the business is growing and the content just kind of helps it. When you flip it and when you work with, you know, I work with a lot of guys that have, for, the, for what I do now, a lot of, you know, subscribers, followers, et cetera. And it's almost like you are, how do I word this? It's almost like you shot steroids your entire life and mm-hmm. now you're w- lifting weights for the first time and it's like completely new. Yeah. And so the the trouble with, with not the trouble, but the challenge only, almost always for every company I've worked with the last few years has been finding out how to create a company that can like grab as much, you know, from the pipeline that's coming in as possible, mm-hmm. knowing that that's going to shut off eventually. So most businesses have to create pipeline. You're like trying to create flow of water, if you will. Mm-hmm. If the, with the content business, it's almost like you have a broken pipeline where there's just water gushing and you're trying mm-hmm. to catch as much of it as possible. Exactly. So how do you keep the pipeline flowing, so to speak? Because I, I know a lot of mm-hmm. info products and just these guys, they, they pop up, they make a bunch of cash, yeah. and then they're gone in a year, two years, three years, right? So how do you consistently stay relevant? Yeah, I think there's there's like the company side, the, the brand side, mm-hmm. and then um, like the, the selling side. Number one is, Iman actually used to say this all the time, but it's not hard to get to the top. It's hard to stay at the top. And I 100%. think Iman is is not only an amazing guy, but one of the reasons that he's world class and will stay at the top for a long time is because he truly has good intention. He has a good heart, and he isn't a different person on camera than he is in person. He's the mm-hmm. he's the same through and through. Um, when it comes to to staying on top, I think the reason a lot of info products specifically, like info product brands and guys, mm-hmm. uh, go you know go through that roller sh- roller coaster is because they just squeeze their audience too much, mm. and so. If you see, if you look at guys, who's a really good example? Um, I don't want to name guys, but yeah. if, if, you, <laughs> That's fine. if you look at people online and yeah. all they do is CTA a program over and over and over, mm-hmm. and every single video that they drop has a CTA at the end of it, and all they're doing is asking, 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 and they might give some value. Mm-hmm. Uh, people burn out of that really quick, right? Mm. And so there's kind of a, a, a give and a take where you you want to have, you know, you want to be able mm-hmm. to extract and liquidate and monetize your audience, but at the same time, the more you squeeze the the faster you kind of end up hitting that peak and going down. Mm-hmm. What would you say to people like Cardone, who's like always pitching and always selling? Yeah, the thing is he's not pitching you on a fifteen hundred dollar, ten grand, fifty grand, whatever offer. Yeah. He's either pitching people on something so expensive that it only relates to 0.1% of his audience, mm-hmm. or he's pitching something so, so cheap. cheap that yeah, you can pitch mm-hmm. over and over a five, ten, twenty, even thirty dollar program. And no one thinks you're trying to make money off that, right? People people think it's it's a broken mentality for for people, but if you pitch a thirty something dollar program, a twenty seven dollar program, a seventeen dollar program, 
people will assume that you're just giving free value to an extent and you're just essentially giving them it at cost or whatever, yeah. right? No one's like, oh yeah, he's he's selling this at $17. Yeah, he's, so he's like, trying to mount, make money from his audience. Yeah. But what no one does that because to create those low ticket pro uh, programs, they have to be, or you know, you call it program books, et cetera, mm -hmm. whatever it is, they have to be so good at that price point that the whole model is essentially, if you get people there, then you can ascend. Yeah, exactly. That, right? And that's but what for, we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, for the ascension, it has to be, that like $17 program has to give them 170, 1000, whatever dollars of value in return. Mm -hmm. And so, to most people are just lazy on that. They they come up with ever you know whatever they can to and and like some BS PDF exactly. or something, yeah. And and then people are like, this wasn't really helpful at all. And then the ascension breaks, right? Uh, and so that process of doing the low ticket is super complicated. Not complicated. I'm sorry. It's never. It's not complicated. Just uh, it's, it's, it requires effort. Effort. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so entrepreneurs are, and humans are like the laziest people in the world, right? <laughs> and so because it requires effort, they don't do it. They instead just do a CTA for their main program and then mm -hmm. that burns up people quick. But that's what you see Cardone and all the big guys do, Ramsey, yeah. et cetera. It's either something for free. I don't like free as much anymore, but something for free, something for low ticket or something for insane high ticket, like yeah. 50 grand, 200 grand, 500 grand. And, and that's kind of where we're shifting to just what, what we've seen in the market, right? For the days of you know, VSL, book a call and then sell 10 grand on, yep. a, <laughs> on a call is... Gone. It's still, yeah, it's gone. It's just, <laughs> it's still out there, but it's, it requires a lot more work yeah. and a lot of sifting through. So we're, I mean, we're all in on low ticket right now because we have the the back end, the fulfillment to be able to like exactly. send people up and because people get value in the stuff that we do. Um, so, you know, we, we just launched like our wealthy you product. It's like $97. It's, you know, call a week with us and, you know, they get a ton of, it's like all Q and A directly with Ryan, um, some other smaller, like, you know, stuff too. And yeah. um, our big thing too, is just trying to offset our ad spend. Yeah, and, see, and I would almost start playing with, there's a really good book you can read called Smart Pricing, but I would mm. almost start playing with with smaller numbers. Yeah, um, so we've launched a 27, uh, we have like a $7, all of his books and stuff like yeah, that too. Books so. are my favorite. Yeah, I think Because sure. then you can get on a podcast like this and say, you, know, yeah. you can read more about that in the book. You know? Exactly. I think Dan Martell is probably the best guy in the space when it comes to- A hundred percent. I love watching that stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's awesome. And if you, have, if you have the back end, that's how it works. The whole VSL to sales call, the thing about that too, so with, with what you're doing, mm -hmm. the whole, what I tell a lot of the guys I work with now is the goal is to essentially get 90% of the sale done before the closing call, mm -hmm. right? Because the other side about the VSL to, to closure thing is you you rely on people and good closures in order to scale companies. And as you start to scale companies, you find out that the hardest thing to scale is people, right? Mm -hmm. So with info product and agency, a lot of the reason that you see a lot of them not, beside personal brand and such, ever be able to exit is because they're people... Every, every business is a people business, but mm -hmm. having to scale rely. through yeah. people and rely on people is a dangerous game. You don't have leverage. The reason software goes for such insane multiples is because you're scaling um, systems, not people. Mm -hmm. right? And so the more with info product that you can create systems that essentially get people to calls where they're already like, hey, I want to pay you. I just, I, don't, I didn't know how, or I just had a couple questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the less talent you need, you should always try to have the best talent in the world. But of course. The less talent you need, the more business or the leverage the business has. The, the easier it is to yeah, scale more you're dollars. you're 100% correct. And that's something that we've realized over the last like two years, right? We, we had very talented salespeople. Like I, I would say some of the sales guys we had were like just top tier. Um, and, but again, th number one, if, if we fill up their pipeline, we fill up their calendars, that's only, there's only so much revenue that they can generate. Like even if we optimized everything, yep. and, you know, it doesn't happen, but let's say we had a hundred percent show rate, right? Like there's still a cap. And then so and now we've also shifted to, we have like a, a few different pipelines. We have like our ticket sales pipeline and all this other stuff because we have you know, just a larger brand. Um, but still, we're, we've encountered the same problem where it's like we have to remove as many variables as we can exactly. from the business, meaning, you know, again, not depending on people. So the slow ticket stuff, like even at the 97 price point, because again, they, they go through a whole funnel, you know, mm -hmm. they go you know, free. 27, then 97, yeah. and then same thing like for our wealth con tickets, you know, those are a thousand bucks to 5,000, depending on what they buy. And, you know, then they go get upsold into the 97 afterwards. Cool. Um, but all that doesn't require a sales team for the most part. Some of our ticket sales stuff does, but like all the other stuff we can run by page, ourselves. Page. Yeah. And so it, it just removes so many variables from it. So I think that's huge. You know, absolutely. Give me more advice. What, what else? <laughs> you know, you, um, yeah. Well, I, the, how, how big, you um, know, yeah, well, in terms of what? Whatever Team size on. or revenue? Revenues. Um, so yeah, we, we did about um, 17 million last year. Okay. So yeah, no, nothing, I mean. And how many low tickets do you have? Um, we just started low ticket. Got it. Um, so all of that was through high ticket um, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. How much, 
So right now your low ticket, you have how many? So um, we have, I mean, we, we're rolling out a bunch of stuff. So our core thing is the 97. That's okay. Wealthy U. That's really where we're seeing a lot of assumptions and upsells and all that. Um, and then we have um, a 27 like wholesale guide because that's like for our real estate stuff. Okay. We basically have three verticals. We have Wealthy Investor, Wealthy Business, Wealthy Creator. And they all together did 17 million or? Um, so our investor brand okay. did everything. And then we have like an agency and then we have like our real estate business. Like I think collectively we did about 50 million in like cash collected last okay. year um and then but the uh, info did 17 yes info did 17 cash and then we do like i i, I i've seen a lot of ways where people do like project the revenue uh, it's like yeah, yeah crow as like contracted revenue yeah, well, there, it's like a hundred thousand dollar contract that you collect two thousand dollars exactly right yeah. so yeah but um so it was, it was cash and right. then um as far as the uh the real estate stuff and all that, but just for info, specifically for a wealthy investor brand. Um, and then we have creator and business, and those are much smaller. Cool. You know, um, but for the main info on 17, you have a $97 yeah. low ticket that yep. you're getting people into, and you're funneling them from how many other lower tickets? Um, so we have probably, I would say, three to four, and we're, okay. we're building up more. Uh, cool. as So we have two books. We have um, like a wholesale guide, so like how to get your first real estate deal, um, and then a few others. Cool. Yeah. Um, I mean that sounds awesome. As long yeah. as you know, I would I would want to look at like the the numbers for each ascension and stuff mm -hmm. or such. The main thing that you want to do is essentially just be able to capture as many angles of people coming in. So like mm -hmm. I, I really, it's way easier to use an analogy of like fat loss mm -hmm. info, sure. right? Because uh, it's B to C, at mm -hmm. least not biz up. Um, so like with fat loss. You can create one low ticket program and then one angle, one VSL and one funnel is about getting into, you know, like a summer body. Mm -hmm. One is about, you know, going down two pant sizes. One is about being able to, to fit in a suit that looks good on you. Yeah. But they all go toward the same exact thing. And I think one of the things that I would encourage a lot of people to do, a lot of people go to the kind of more is more. Uh, mm -hmm. I think less is more in a lot of ways, but finding out how to to create different angles to get someone in the same program is exactly one of, one of the things I would focus on. Yeah. Like and so I love that you brought that up because that's similar to what we're doing right now. So that wealthy you, it, 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 it's the same product for all three verticals that we have. Cool. Right. So like, at, and that's one of the best parts too, because, and this call, we have all of our students on too. Yeah. So, so we it have, it's like FOMO if you, yeah. In the, like exactly. The whole, yeah. So people are sharing their wins like, oh, I just got my first real estate deal. Cool. Oh, like this video went viral, like whatever. Right. Yeah. And then so they're like, oh, like what program are you in? And then so like, and then we have like our customer service people in there. Like we're, our, our main target is we wanted to do about 40% of our revenue this year in ascensions. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's like our, one of our big goals. I love that. Um, and so like, what do you see as far as trends for this year in the info space? Um, number one, I see influencer marketing going way up, right? Mm. Uh, not just in the info space, but pretty much anything online. We were talking about this prior yeah. to, but you see Mark Zuckerberg and, and big tech CEOs starting to do it. And you'll see um, product brands starting to do it. But the... The in, I mean, even if you just look at social media right now, mm -hmm. the, the trends I see, number one, just going kind of broad, mm -hmm. I see YouTube changing a lot this year. I don't think YouTube's gonna, way? I don't yeah. think it's gonna hit the same way it did for the last few years, right? Interesting. And so example example given, what happens, right? If you land on a funnel, like you, you click something and it ends up bringing you to a funnel with a VSL, mm -hmm. what do you think? What do you mean? Like, what do you think? What do you think about the funnel? So, are like, you, you know, I'm like, okay, cool. Like, uh, I'll, I, I tell as like, as a customer yeah, or well, as like me? As a customer, let's, yeah. let's position this to someone says, I created this free thing of value. And, like, then you, right. and then you click it and it takes you to a funnel with a VSL. Uh, I'm skip. I'm probably going to skip the VSL. I'm going to fill out my info and try to get the free thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. In short, before five years ago, when ClickFunnels was like first a thing, people would be like, oh, this video is probably going to be really helpful. Right? Yes. VSLs were like not known things. Funnels were not known things. Mm -hmm. What's happening now is if you open up YouTube, Pretty much every single thing that you see on YouTube is now a marketing piece, of, you know, material or sales letter or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I think that just like funnels have created a lot of resistance and VSLs have a lot of resistance, what's going to start to happen is YouTube, I think, will have a lot more resistance than it did before. Mm -hmm. And so I think, it, and I think a couple things on YouTube. Number one, I think it's going to be met with more resistance when it comes to, to to selling liquidating. Number two is, I just think that overall the amount of um, to staying apart from the crown on YouTube is going to get even harder, you mm -hmm. know, just in general. Yeah, and then, there's more content than ever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, t I, what I see working really well is probably TikTok to Instagram, and then Instagram kind of squeezing audience, like I said, to to, mm -hmm. to work on that. The the YouTube stuff realistically is just. And are you talking organic YouTube, paid YouTube, or both? 
I mainly look at organic. Yeah, yeah. I don't okay. actually. I know you said marketing genius. I don't know a lot about ads. And marketing. <laughs> I'd be surprised at how how little I've I've probably spent like five minutes inside of a business manager before. Uh, yeah. Um. I've I've only focused on like the sales machine mm -hmm. after a lead is kind of created or at least a view is a, Got uh, it. a view turns into some kind of contact. Okay. And I work on that a little bit, but I don't. I know. I don't ever mm -hmm. do stuff like that. But, um, what I see working really well is, and everyone knows this right now already, short form content mm -hmm. to some kind of Instagram page or YouTube. Uh, nurturing them with long form content. Mm -hmm. And then usually through some kind of free asset, HVC, high value content, creating some kind, you know, a contact that then you can reach out to, start email marketing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think, what I personally try to do too is I always, one of my favorite expressions is better is not better, but different is better. Mm -hmm. And so right now you also see, we're in Vegas, Hermosi mm -hmm. with Sam Ovens creating a lot of school groups, right? Yep. So every info product right now is creating a school group. Mm -hmm. So one of the so first funny. things, say again? I just think it's so funny because I, I all of a sudden it's just Hermosi's doing it, so everybody's doing everybody's it too. Doing it. Yeah. So that means to me, it's the last thing I want to do. So I actually just created, a, uh, I'm not trying to CTA. Yeah, yeah, go group, ahead, yeah. I just created a group. It's actually more of like a, a journal where it, like every, every day when I'm working on stuff, you know, I just log it at the end and everyone wanted it on school, but I put it on Slack for a dollar a day, right? There we go. And Everyone loves it because it's mm -hmm. it's it's just different than what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what I think realistically you're going to start to see is, you know, everyone's doing YouTube. I, I also think I'm just yeah, ranting no, at this. Yeah, point, I, I love it. It's good. It's good yeah, value. It's always, you know, right now everyone's getting on YouTube and organic because mm -hmm. everyone was doing paid ads, right? And so mm -hmm. paid ads got expensive. They got super competitive, etc. Now everyone's switching their funds to organic content, mm -hmm. you know, studios, etc. I think paid ads will start to get a lot more effective again, you know? Interesting. Everyone, it's almost like a crowd of people running from one to the other to the, to, you know, back mm. and forth, back and forth. And so I think that as more more people start to do organic, I think paid ads are gonna start to hit better. I think as, you know, as 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 people realize, oh, okay, we've gotta go back to paid ads and organic's gonna start to hit mm -hmm. better. Uh, I think the people that just pick one lane for the most part is their stable is always gonna be the people. Oh, for sure. Um, but on this, on this like upcoming year, 2024, what I see is paid ads to some kind of organic content uh, and then getting that organic content into some kind of community, probably not on school. I love <laughs> Sam Ovens. I love Hermosi. Yeah. But if everyone's doing it, you got to do something different. Yeah. And, you know, try to meet people with where they're at. So if you're in real estate, I'm guessing a lot of your clients. Well, it's funny. So we were on school before Hermosi bought them. Okay. So it was just the community that we that we landed on because that's part of it. Uh, we yeah. just need to us. It doesn't matter. We might even move off of school and go on to go high level because um, right. for it, community. They, they have a community feature now. Do they? Yeah. So, dude, they're rolling out new things all the time. Um, so we, as far as CRMs go, we, we've kind of run, we've bit, we bounced around. So we were on HubSpot initially. Yep. Um, and it just worked because we have a ton of email marketing, yeah. all, all that stuff. Everything's in one place. Yeah, everything's, it was great. And then um, we moved to Close because Close people- Close is my favorite CRM. I loved Close. Yep. It was like the best as far as for sales. Yep. Everything was super simple. Our sales team loved it. Um, then <laughs> Ryan heard, he's like, dude, like go high level is the new thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 you can have everything in one spot. I'm like, we used to have everything in one spot, yeah. but anyway, so, so we moved over to go high level and I it's actually, I hate GHL for, yeah. uh, for large scale info. I think it's the worst move you can make. Yeah. Why, why is that? The way I word it to people uh -huh. is, so there's like three tiers. There's beginner, there's intermediate, there's advanced. I would say a million ish a month. You're probably mm -hmm. in, in the intermediate stage. Yeah. All right. But beginner is GHL. GHL to me is probably the best beginner or agency yeah. uh, CRM that you can have. It's cheap. You get everything, you know, all mm -hmm. in one place. You, the features in there are great for the value. Yeah. When you start, but what I say is realistically, GHL is where you automate a lot of stuff to, mm -hmm. to supplement for not having a lot of manpower. Mm -hmm. When you have manpower, the whole game becomes like, how do you give your army the most effective weapons possible? Yep. And I've done the same. I've used HubSpot, CR, um, GHL, and Close, and 100% a sales team is always the most effective on Close. 100%. Yeah, you know, I'm sure your your sales team probably was pissed the day that you switched to GHL. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, like, I mean, so this has only been like, we're about three months into the migration, and yeah, they, they've been on it for two months. Um, and I still see... I'm, I. I still see them on close sometimes, just, yeah, just managing right. it back because it is, it's so much easier. It's quicker, it's faster. It's e the smart yeah. views, like it's, yeah. it's the only, it's that's the thing, it's smart views. Yeah, right? so we've we, we've created smart views in GHL. Yeah, but they're not the same. The, no, it, it, just, it just takes longer to update and stuff like that. That's the thing because close has a native app. Yeah. And so it's in the, the mobile apps even better too, but like on the on the desktop, it's, it works so yeah. well. And uh, yeah, so the, well, the only thing that isn't great about Close is if you're international, then the, the dialing in Close yeah. is the API. Well, we're, we're not. We're, the, I would say ninety five percent of our business is U S based. The companies that I know that are there's. 
there's only one reason to grow off close into what would mm -hmm. be tier three, which is like HubSpot slash Salesforce. Yeah. Um, and that is that you're doing so much email marketing and your setters need to know what people are looking at and opting yeah. to have better conversations. And so and that such. was yeah. helpful when yeah. we were on um, HubSpot that like our sales team could see, okay, yeah. like they opened these five or but six they didn't, emails. They didn't use yeah. it as leverage. I mean, they, they used it. Um, I, I think... It, it was just where we were at at the time and then where we grew, we started getting a few more like um, devs in, in the mix. And so like- yeah. HubSpot things just, and Salesforce are tricky. Like exactly. Close is a dummy, Simple. a dummy could use it. Exactly. You know? But HubSpot, even for a salesperson just to navigate the list and everything like that, it's so yeah. heavy. Um, and at, I don't, I don't yeah. like switching. I don't, I don't recommend those two CRMs ever unless there's actual need for it. Yeah. But I, I would argue to you, you're probably making a regression, man. GHL, yeah. I, I have a funny GHL mm -hmm. story too, if you want to hear it. But close, I think if you have an actual sales team with SDRs, mm -hmm. closers, maybe triagers, finishers, et cetera, yeah. close is going to be the, the best way to- I agree 100%. So like, I'm going to take this part of the podcast. I'm going to give it to Ryan. Ryan, you got to get I, on close again. Because everybody, I mean, it's funny. Yeah. I, I, I'm fully in agreement because the sales team is so much more effective. And like, I've seen it in just in the numbers. Um, and you know, we, we have a decent brand, so we're able to kind of get away with a little bit more than I think some yeah. people well, that's the, can't. That's the thing, bro. Mm -hmm. The, the downside to, I know this so well from working with all these content guys that I work with now, but content and brand can, is, is leverage. Mm -hmm. It's also a crutch. Like it, it, For it sure. yeah, it really allows you to get away with stuff that you shouldn't, but eventually yeah. at scale, then it, it, yeah. it really- the, the cracks start to show. Exactly, and it gives yeah. you a glass ceiling. And, and, and the, the other thing with, with GHL, and you know, HubSpot could do some of this, but like the automations are solid, I think, on, on yes, GHL. Yes, 100%. That's so, what Close sucks at. Yeah. Close's API is ass. Ex exactly, yeah, but, <laughs> no, you're good. Yeah, GHL is, is great for that, but at your level of business, mm -hmm. you should be able to have a developer that pretty much easily can develop any anything custom with Close. Exactly, yeah, and then that's the thing. I, I think we didn't take the time to like develop it as custom as we could have, um, and we still needed a place to house a lot of our marketing so you know it is what it is um so th there's still there's still possibility for us to switch back and at least for the sales team i, I think yeah. i'm okay and we do a lot of our landing pages on ghl yeah, so we kind of we cut off a lot of the click funnel stuff and so right the thinking was just keeping everything in one in one, in one spot yeah. um my, my yeah. favorite saying on that so everyone knows like a jack of all trades master right? of none yeah exactly but i think it, to be a jack of all trades in personal life I think is great. You want to mm -hmm. know a little bit of everything. Yeah. Right? It makes you well-rounded. Yeah. It, it makes you more ready to, to and prepared for life. But I think money loves a master of one, right? Yep. And so I, when I look at when I, we've tried to put everything in one spot for simplicity, because uh, you know Ty Lopez says, "Keep it stupid simple, kiss it." Yeah. And so one spot makes things more simple, ideally, or you know, in theory. But realistically, what I realize is, if I take people off clothes, then sales performance goes down, right? Mm -hmm. And if I take my email marketers off of HubSpot or ActiveCampaign, email performance goes down because delivery rate goes down. Yep. Uh, and everything likes, you know, there is a reason that some things only do one thing and people at, you know, multi hundred million still uses it. It's because it, it does, does well. It does well. Yeah. Yeah, and so, and, yeah I agree. Yeah. But <laughs> I, G, I know the founders of GHL pretty yeah. well. I, I, what, I had a, call, a convo with them once. I was setting up an affiliate deal. I had no idea how big GHL was as a company. I, they're, I'm pretty yeah. sure a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah, we just had like, um, we just did like an interview, Ryan did with with, yeah. with them. And then like, so we we did like some onboarding and stuff too. But so yeah, they're, they're massive. I didn't I didn't realize. I, I'm pretty sure they're over a B at this point. In I wouldn't be surprised. And so I, I had a call with them. We were setting up an affiliate deal and it, it was the two found, two of the three founders and then their affiliate manager. And I thought that the company I was, you know, working with was the bigger, the bigger company, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of like, you know. You tried to like. I didn't try, I did, that's the thing. I, I, I just, I went in and kind of like, you know, was yeah, yeah. a heavy hammer, sorry. No, you're good. And the guy that was on the call with me from my team, he was like, how the fuck did you do that? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, don't you know that? And he told me all about it. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah, you wouldn't have handled it the same <laughs> yeah, way. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was thankful because it worked and it ended up going really well. GHL, like the guys are awesome and the, yeah. and the software and the company is amazing to a certain extent. I don't mm -hmm. think it's meant for companies your size. You know? and, and that's what I was trying to tell Ryan. I was like, dude, like, I think this works at like, you know, again, like you said, for people who have, don't have a large yeah. sales team or Two, whatever. Three, four million, it's yeah. fine. And and because again, you, the automations are solid. And But like when you have, we, again, we have like 20, 20 people up there um, that are just all dialing and, and working. And it's like people are stepping on each other's toes and it just gets, yeah. it's not as effective just because it doesn't update in real time, the exactly. dialer and all this yep. stuff. So. All those small little seconds 
add up to like a lot of, of used unused time. Exactly. So what I've been doing is we have a test right now. I have like two of our reps just <laughs> enclosed so that way I can show some data. <laughs> just <laughs> like, all right, right. F okay. Figure it out. Um, so what does your team look like today? I, I So I just started what mm -hmm. I'm doing now two months ago. And so we have a, a small portfolio company, uh, only four or five companies inside of it. The main thing that I focus on is our consulting firm where we work with info products, mm -hmm. um, doing kind of what we've been talking about. Yeah. And that is really, really slim. It's just me. It's my COO. It's a VP of sales and a, a sales rep at SDR. That's and awesome. that's all it is. Yeah. Um, the, the margins have been amazing. Right now, I'm really just focused on cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, and then what the next... So what I structured, essentially, is... And I, I, I told you I didn't want to get too too much into this because I don't want it to sound like I'm just trying to talk about my company. Yeah, no, I, it's but good. We work with companies. Our smallest company... Right now, our client in the partner and scale stuff is probably like three, four million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the companies are doing anywhere from like eight to to fifteen ish, mm -hmm. right? Um, eight to twenty ish. Yeah. And what we do is we have like a four month dating period, essentially, where it just we know at this point w where you are, kind of how much money we're probably going to make you over the next year, and we take ten percent of what we're expected to, to help you gross. Okay. And then after four months, if it's a good relationship, and so far every single relationship has has led to turning into this. Then we talk about actual portfolio stuff where we we mm -hmm. acquire um, uh, at least a small part of, yeah. of the business. Uh, I really only care about doing that because I like what Hermosi can do and say that he has portfolio business. Mm -hmm. It sounds so much better better than saying like I have an agency that helps people grow their businesses and I For take sure. pressure and such. Yeah. So I don't really care about the actual equity because none of these companies will likely sell. But to be able to say that from the brand perspective, I think is pretty clean. Yeah. Uh, that's been awesome. The other companies in the portfolio are agencies where we essentially found people that were top tier at what they do so mm -hmm. like one of the best email copywriters in the world that does most of you know some big brands like they do he does all their email and so we took him i think he was massively undervalued and we started a company with him and that company has skyrocketed it's doing mm -hmm. that you know it's probably like 30 days and it's on track already for like 200 something thousand cash collected which i think Love for like no, the first 30 days for just one of the spinoffs is pretty solid yeah um and then we have a systems company uh, we're doing we're we're spinning off another website company and uh, just kind of growing that. What mm -hmm. I've what I've learned is that business is way more fun when you work with incredibly smart people. Like mm -hmm. I said, you don't ever, ha ever have to be like leveraged out where you need them, but starting stuff where essentially you're just helping drive traffic and someone's amazing and fulfilling. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been that's been the agency stuff that I've been doing. The the main thing I focus on with time is either writing sales letters and HVC, all that stuff that mm -hmm. we talked about with the low ticket stuff. I'm, I'm I've probably written like 400 pages of like content if you will over wow. the last like 30 days it's been you know that's crazy all i do all day long or client calls mm -hmm. so this podcast run is, is pretty new for me i've never never done stuff like this i hope i'm doing well no i think you're doing great and dropping value <laughs> so with when writing all this content like what are your key focuses specifically if you're writing like a sales letter i talked to the copywriter guy that we started a company mm -hmm. with he actually went through the first one with me he dumbed it everything down so that it was simple. He, Dan Kinney did it, right? Mm -hmm. he, yeah. he did something super, like I took something complex. It was about essentially how to structure compensations for like COOs, mm -hmm. um, VPs, developers, et cetera, so that you're you're helping them build with vision, uh, not costing the money, the business too much now, getting people for cheaper now so that, and, and more expensive probably later, but mm -hmm. in a way that, that works well for, for company. And so I took that and I made it simple and he made it more simple. And what I realized is, I hated it. One of the things I love, I think one of the best in the world at doing this, the two best in the world at taking complex things right now and making them simple are Hermosi and Ty Lopez. Mm. But the thing is, and this is not shade by any means to Hermosi, sometimes what you do is you oversimplify something too much to where you miss the nuance and then the point is kind of lost. Uh, and so that happened a lot. What I realized is with all this stuff, I think one of the guys who still does his own copy for a lot of the HVC he puts out is Taylor Welch, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think... It's one of the things you can't be lazy on. This is why, you know, massive businesses don't do it. It's because I can't get a copywriter to write what's in my brain because they've never experienced it. Mm -hmm. I have to actually do it. Right. Yep. And so I'm not kidding. I've probably spent at least every week 50 hours just typing. Wow. Uh, before client calls and everything. Mm -hmm. and I know that sounds like uh, like bullshit, but genuinely, no, you know, he's been over there. We've been at the <laughs> office from like 8 a.m. to, to 1 a.m. Uh, pretty much six days a week. It's been crazy. Wow. Uh, and a lot of it's just writing. So anyway, my focus has essentially been finding, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to write stuff for people doing, you know, one, $2 million a, a year. That That is so far away from everything that I've thought about over the last few years mm -hmm. that I really couldn't attain to that or, or, or talk about that. Mm -hmm. 
but guys doing five, 10, 15, 20 million a yeah. year, uh, I've gone through a lot of those challenges recently and I, I've been on yeah. that wavelength. And so my whole thing is just writing about everything I've essentially learned and failed at. It's, mm. it's almost just writing about my failures and what yeah. I've learned from the failures. So what are like the most top of mind failures that you've learned from recently? Um, a lot of it is leadership and hiring, you mm -hmm. know, gen uh, genuinely. A lot of it too is just, you know, offers. I've definitely had ideas for offers that sounded and theoretically should have worked, mm -hmm. but they were they were terrible. Like they probably <laughs> lost millions, and millions, and millions of dollars. Wow. Um, so anything about offers and how to package and clarity on offers, um, a lot of system stuff. I've actually mm -hmm. written probably some pretty intense stuff on just overall tech stack for companies. I'm an operations nerd. Mm -hmm. I love ops. I, I'm, I'm kind of like branded internally in the uh, world that I'm in as a sales guy because I have a sales program and such. Mm -hmm. But I love systems and ops. That's kind mm -hmm. of actually what I like to talk about most. And so whether it's like, you know, the the mistakes I've made with scaling sales teams and, you know, internship programs for sales teams and stuff like that, mm -hmm. or, you know, different things I've done with hiring that I've learned from, uh, different HR things that I've learned. That's that's all the stuff that I, Got that I write about. In so what are the common pitfalls you're seeing with people scaling their sales teams and when they're in this, you know, we'll, we'll call it like 10 to $15 million range? Uh, 10 to 15 mil, number one is... Most people don't know how to, how do you hire sales reps right now? What's your process? Um, so we go like, we'll have a bunch of different places. So we'll recruit from Ryan's page, LinkedIn, after, whatever. So after you get the, So after we get them in, so yeah. it's um, initial like phone assessment, phone screening. Then we do so a- Written an application to phone screening. Yeah, written application. Phone screening. How do you go from written application to phone screening? Like um, I mean, <laughs> truly, it's it's me. Um, so I, right now, I vet everybody based on just like my experience. Like I've, I've been in sales for like 10, 15 yeah. years. So I can like kind of sift through the BS. Just on the right written application. Yeah, on the written application. So I'm like, okay. How, many, how many applications do you get per? <sighs> a lot. Um, and so, like that's yeah, so it, it's a terrible use of my time and, yeah. and I know it. Um, but I still haven't been able to duplicate that out. And also we did play around with like a survey. Um, I, I look for, it's a mix of experience. I also mm -hmm. make, and that's truly like really what I'm looking for. It's like experience and then also do like, how do they position their resume too? Cause I think as okay. a salesperson, you have to like be able to sell yourself just on paper too. I, but the biggest differentiator for me is the phone interview. Like in yeah. the beginning, it's like, okay, like- But the rate can takes you a lot of time at first. Right? It does. So yeah. like it, one thing I would say is, we we got for the last company it was with thousands and thousands of applications for every single role. Yeah, and so one of the things that I started instilling is realizing like, I I kind of thought to myself, what do I actually care about on the written application? Mm. And I cared about a few things. Number one, do they have good grammar? I'm a grammar. Freak, yep, right? for sure. And if you're in sales, you can't like have broken grammar and text people. It's not going to work. So I checked for grammar, which you can have AI do now. And then I number two checked for how much they answered each question because if someone you know it almost measuring intent mm -hmm. and so if I had an application that had like six words on the entire thing people are just barely filling it out that's something that I never even want to see because I know I'm going to kill it but like at thousands even just seeing that and having to cancel it out takes a little bit of time mm -hmm. right and then thirdly is uh, essentially I. I think really it was mostly the first two, grammar and then intent mm -hmm. on filling it out. Oh, the third thing is detail, um, mm. attention to detail. So so on my, on the applications, I would have them essentially have to do something in that application. Like sometimes it's name your favorite pasta or you know in the mm -hmm. subject line, have this or whatever, just trip questions. And then you would set up keyword results. So what we would do is we ran our applications and I do this with every company now on type form. Mm -hmm. And then specifically, the, the best thing I ever did was on the written application beforehand, you had to watch a hiring video. Do you have a hiring video? In we process? do. Um, so, well, we have an onboarding video, so we don't have a hiring. Well, we have a hiring video on our main website, but it's cool. very brief. It's like just Ryan, so hey, you know, I'm a, hiring six figure earners, yeah. whatever. Yeah. I, I would make a 15, 20 minute video and mm. go over the core values of your company, what you're looking for, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Right. Something that can just evergreen live on, 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 the, on the page and yeah. be pretty much for every single world. Then, do you have core values? In the yeah, of course. Cool. How many? Uh, five. Oh, yeah. Too many. Uh, we can go into that too. Ooh, okay, let's get to that. Okay, yeah, you should that. almost always aim for three. Layla Hermosi does a really good job talking about that. If yeah. you stole it from her, um, but so I would go over the core values, and then on the type form, yeah. I would ask people the core values in the mission. On the type form, I would ask people what the core values were, like mm -hmm. each one, and there was like mm -hmm. a list of twenty, and you had to pick them. And if you picked anything wrong, yeah. you would you would answer a few more questions, but I, the t application was actually never seen by the team. You would just get an automatic decline email soon. Interesting, right? And what I learned is. A lot of people, if you're getting applications, written applications, they're just spamming them out to everybody, mm -hmm. right? They see something, they're like, I'm gonna apply, there's no interest, et cetera. 
I want people that really feel committed to actually wanting to learn about the company before they came in. So the hiring video is probably the most important thing I ever did for hiring. And then the trip questions from the hiring video essentially showed me who's going through the video, who's not. And then the other thing that we had is, you know, what is the mission of the company? And I pretty much verbatim mentioned the mission mission of the company in the video and then how how much how aligned that is, if you will, to, mm -hmm. to what I actually said. Aside from the other stuff is is what we set up automations on. So we set up automations on cancels for word count and for we had an AI, we eventually set this up if it was manual at first, but AI checking for essentially grammar, right? A grammar mm -hmm. score. Uh, and then the core values, of course, if they were right or wrong, yeah. it would send people out. And so that that's number one that as to mm -hmm. probably how you could save some time on the hiring oh, process. Oh, for sure. Right? Yeah. Then on the phone stuff, uh, if you're how many phone interviews would you say you have? Or if you have one sales rep opening? One sales rep opening, um, shoot, we're probably doing like 50 or so. Yeah, and each one's like 15 minutes-ish? Yeah, roughly. So I, I did duplicate. I, I removed myself from that. Okay. I do have... Um, See, that's, yeah. that's the... Second thing that a lot of people do mm -hmm. that I would say is a mistake. Yeah. And what we've changed recently is we're doing kind of group interviews. Good. Yeah. Cool. So okay. uh, we do group Zoom interviews now. Cool. Before or after the phone? Um, so the phone now, it, it, the phone used to be about a 15 minute conversation. The phone now is about a two minute conversation just to get them onto the group okay. interview. That's cool. Yeah. So the a lot of people do phone interviews, but the problem mm -hmm. with it is not scalable, right? Time wise. Mm -hmm. And I think the most... The biggest mistake I've ever made, I learned this from Dan. He, so he actually applied to Dan Martell's company. Oh, interesting. Uh, over DMs. Yeah. And Dan called him. Dan Martell called him and took time. And I learned something that I've been thinking about and this kind of just sealed the point in for me, which is I have an innate ability from the experience I have to just see if someone's going to be good or not. Yep. Just like you do. Exactly. Right? It's just something you get with years of experience. And when you try to delegate hiring to people that don't have that, you get not great fits. I'll put it that way. A thousand percent. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's it's one of those things. Layla Hermosi talks about how she didn't start to de like delegate hiring for 250 people until she was 250 people or something. Mm -hmm. And Dan Martell is still doing his hiring. I got lazy at a certain point mm -hmm. and, and thought that that's where I could delegate time and get time back. And if I look at companies that I've worked with where I delegated hiring too early, I would say that the hiring after versus before when I was in the process was completely different, right? Mm -hmm. Understandably. Uh, I was giving it to people who had way less experience, way less scope as to what, you know, that it factor that you have that you can just see in people, other people don't have that that lens to, to see that same thing. And so the phone interview, I know you're not doing it, but it's really, really common mm -hmm. and people delegate it to other people. I've seen, I have a company right now that I work with that's doing like a mil and a half a month and some random operations person out of college that was with the company for two months is now doing his phone interviews. So oh like, man. Bro, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you're gonna kill any any like scope of finding talent and you're probably just, gonna, anyway, yeah. it's so common. So if you're mm -hmm. listening to this and you do that, uh, group interviews is 100% what I would, what I would mm -hmm. instill and encourage. And my group interviews, I, they were called the Hunger Games whenever I used to do them. They, they were, you know, he went through it, yeah. they were they Talk were to me about the format that you do for the group interview. Yeah. So the first thing I, there's the the most important thing before the group interview was that I always told someone or t you know there's an email that went out essentially saying, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this in a way that's not specific to the company that I was with but more what you can do because yeah. I don't like going into the stuff that that you know we did as a private company sure but I would send out an email saying and there you know I would do a video application before the before the group interview because mm -hmm. the other thing too is you'll get a lot of people that send in videos and you kind of know right away mm -hmm. and this guy has the comm skills versus doesn't especially for sales reps so mm -hmm. I would go screening interview to automatic email that goes out saying hey you have till x date to send in a, a video application the video application has to be on YouTube not as a short but as an unlisted video uh, it, you have to be wearing a black t-shirt mm -hmm. you have to hand draw a water bottle in the video uh, and then you have to do, you have to answer X questions. The video has to be 60 to 120 seconds long. If it's 59 seconds or 121 seconds, it's not going to be checked, right? All these little things are, are trippers. And so what I wanted to do, what I realized, especially for sales reps, bro, there's mm -hmm. no, there's no more operationally or, or there's no one who's more prone to making detailed mistakes or exactly. operational mistakes than sales reps. hundred percent. So I would constantly look for that. Right. And so I'd say 70% of the application, applications we got would trip out on one of those. The video was 120 seconds long or 121 seconds long, or someone was wearing the wrong color t-shirt or the water bottle was printed instead of hand-drawn, whatever it was, mm -hmm. right? All these little details I'm looking for. And then the, the other thing too is I can see right off the gate if they have that kind of charisma and presence needed on video to actually, you know, mm -hmm. be on a group interview. And so the goal was on group interviews and the goal for you should always be a, to have 25 to, to 30 people per group interview. If mm -hmm. you have 70 people, then you do two group interviews or so, yeah. right? Each one about an hour, hour and a half. And when people come on, 
There's another email after that that says more instructions. So it would be take your water bottle and now draw or write the name of someone on your team on like on, you know, mm -hmm. your team on the water bottle. And so they have to do a little more research on the company. You say can't be my name or Ryan Pineda's name or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So they have to do research, look at your LinkedIn, et cetera, you know, find other people at the company. When they research that shows intent and, and desire to actually want to be there, they probably learn more about the company too. That builds uh, all these little steps also build the like the badge of honor that they wear on the other end. Right. So if you look mm -hmm. at the military, they're or the police, uh, police academies, et cetera, mm -hmm. you don't just become, you know, a, a Marine or a, a police officer. You have to go through a process to get there. Yeah. And that's why the badge is so much more powerful when you get it, right? So it's the same mm. thing with hiring process. I like to really make it hard, unlike most companies, yeah. so that when you get to the other side, you're, like, you feel yeah. like you really earned it and deserved it. And so I would have all these trippers. Now it's wear a white t-shirt, have, you know, have this. It would be have your favorite book, on your left side, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, people would come from their right side and I would be like, that's not it. I said left side kind of thing. Uh, all these little trippers again on the group interview. And within the first two minutes, my goal was always to DQ five people. Like, mm -hmm. you know, whether it was it, one of the things that we would say is be on a desktop where you're going to be taking Zoom calls if you're a sales rep. And so if they came on an iPhone where it was vertical, it's an automatic DQ. If they were on the road or in their car, it was an automatic DQ. Uh, if they were wearing the wrong shirt, if they were a minute late because we want punctuality from mm -hmm. the very beginning of the process, all the values that we operational values of like be on time, we start that. Right. And so within the first two or three minutes, my goal is to essentially DQ five people solely for the sake of letting everyone else on the, on the call know like, oh, shit, this guy is like, oh, and you're cutting them on the call on the call right in front of everybody. Like, oh, I love moving. that. And, and you'll see everyone go like. <laughs> Oh shit! I actually, I have. Yeah. So, so bro, really quick, just tell me like how that goes. Okay, so like you're out, you're out. I'd be like, hey, Javi, bro. I'll be honest, man. We take time super seriously here. You're a minute late. Can't let that happen, bro. You're free to apply next time, but wish you the best of luck. I right? love it. And then remove them. I had people tell me after they come on <laughs> that. So what you would do is you would essentially go through and you the group. We can go into the rest of the format, but you would go and you would talk to everyone for like thirty seconds a minute or whatever. Be mm -hmm. go through send everyone to the waiting room and you should always have at least one or two other people from your team on the call so you can deliberate with them. Yeah, They'll see stuff you don't see because you're talking, you're thinking questions. They'll be like, this guy was on his phone or not paying attention, blah, 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 right? Um, but one one guy told me when he was in that waiting room, he had to, he had to really use the restroom mm -hmm. and he didn't want to have, you know, come back from the waiting room and not be on the Zoom camera because he was in the restroom. Yeah. And so he told me that essentially he had a water bottle to his left. No way. And yeah, he took a piss in a water bottle <laughs> on, on, at his desk because he didn't want to have to worry about it. Hey, well, yep. it's dedication, man. It's dedication. I don't know. I don't know if he ended up joining or not. I don't, I don't remember if we, uh, we sent him further in the process, but I remember thinking like, wow, these are savage group interviews. People, yeah. people would talk about the fact that they were like sweating through their shirts and everything on them. Um, and I kind of like that. I know it sounds- I, No, I like uh, it too. Yeah, yeah, but it's just, you know, it made people feel so appreciative of the role. And it also, it made people on the team know that we really govern the culture and the people that came into the team, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you just let any Joe Smo in, then top tier players are like, I don't want to, you know. Yeah, it's like, well, I'm not, this isn't an A team. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, the rest of the group interview format is essentially just having enough time going through stuff and kind of grilling people. I was, I, I, there's a lot of interview questions I asked. <laughs> I probably shouldn't talk about on this because I don't know if they're necessarily like compliant in, in certain ways. One yeah. of the perks of working internationally is you don't have to. Oh, you have to deal with the U.S. compliance as issues. much so. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but anyway, we, just really getting to see I, what I would look for personally is, you know, how people held themselves, mm -hmm. how sharp they were, like their, their le level of competence, if you will, on the call. Mm -hmm. uh, and then integrity. I would ask a lot of questions that made people kind of have to, to be honest or, or tell the truth mm -hmm. in ways that wasn't normal in a group interview process or even single interview process. And then I would almost fact check it on the call with them. And I've, you know, mm -hmm. I would give, you, you, I would put people on their heels purposely. And when people are on their heels and they're uncomfortable and they still do the right thing or, t or, or tell the truth, then you kind of see how they deal with pressure. You see who, you know, what they would, as much as you can, you would you would see what they do when no one's looking kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? And so I would say that a lot of people that came through the companies that I, I used to do that kind of hiring process for were just really solid, mm -hmm. solid people. Yeah, and I think you give a ch you get a chance to, like you said, put them on their heels. And yeah. especially with sales or just any role when you're in a startup, like it, there will be yeah. times where you are under pressure or there 100%. are things that like, are going to be pushing you. So I, I think that's great. And so yeah. now are you doing any sort of skills assessment as well? Or? Yeah, we did Criteria Core. You okay. know Criteria Core? Not really, no. Yeah. Um, this is something I did not perfect. So when we started doing this kind of testing stuff, uh, when I've done this in the past, 
I switched the hiring process to more of a, uh, I kind of Ty Lopez did. So, mm. you know, Ty runs this internship thing. I actually just on his story, he's doing a, a Zoom call on Friday where essentially if you're interested in doing it, then you do an aptitude test. And if you have a high enough aptitude toward whatever disposition or mm. skill, then you kind of get into an internship program. And from the internship program, you you can earn a spot. Yeah. And I saw that. I kind of wanted to play with that with different, different um, that different methodology. And it, it was a big failure for me. Did really? Not, did not work well. Uh, and Why? so, um, a lot, of, a lot of it is that I thought you could essentially take that group interview feeling and almost Andy Elliott, if you will, the the internship and make mm -hmm. it like super ruthless and such. Yeah. But that the there's so many things to it, right? Number one is that you can't have interns working the same kind of lead pool that you have core team working, right? And so then you have to give them a different lead pool. And then if you give them a different lead pool where you're giving them a disadvantage essentially because they're working cooler stuff, how do you compensate that? And then, mm -hmm. and then you know, aside from that, where how do you essentially you know, top tier people coming in through that process are going to see that they're working terrible leads and they're, and they're, they're not going to want to stay. Get me the fuck out of here. Yeah. Kind of so nothing about it. There's a lot of, of failures in there that that we could get into, but nothing about it worked for me. Um, and so what I would do if I, in hindsight, is I was I would take that criteria core thing, and I'd probably do it before the video application. Specifically, the cool thing about Criteria Core is it's got an aptitude, and you have to be very strange about testing in the mm -hmm. United States. I don't know if you know that's, yeah. um, but you can't run like IQ tests or anything in, mm -hmm. in the US. And so, depending on where you are, running you can run a sales disposition test on Criteria Core, for example. Given so, you can see, and this was really cool. We actually had our entire team do it at some point, and there were a couple people on the team that I didn't know if they were if they had that sales factor in them, mm -hmm. uh, and they were, they were the only people that I ever tested is less sales disposition people. Mm -hmm. And so, I would run if I was hiring for salespeople, sales people, sales disposition test, depending on where you are in the world, maybe an aptitude test. Mm -hmm. uh, aptitude is essentially how it's it's intelligence, right? How yeah. fast someone can learn information, the speed of which someone can learn. Uh, I would do that. And if they broke certain barriers that it wouldn't set too high, just essentially making sure that someone has some, some factor to them, yeah. then I would take them to the video. Then I would do the group interview. After group interview, probably two one-on-one -on -one inter interviews, one with whoever is probably your right-hand person. Mm -hmm. And then if they pass them on, then one with you. Yeah, um, and that would be that the, like the hiring process. If you yeah, will, that I love that. Sense. And so yeah, we do. Um, it's called the predictive index. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but kind of similar aptitude type tests where it's like it doesn't necessarily say like if they're capable of doing the job, but it's if they're predisposed to it and if they'll get fulfillment out yeah, of the same, job. Same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we we do that, and then we do uh, a cog test. It's a cognitive assessment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now that you're saying it, I'm like, I don't know if it's compliant. It's, so. not, it's definitely not compliant in the US, <laughs> but. Yeah. But I mean, but we, have, we don't, it's just, anyway. No, the US is weird. Yeah. The US literally doesn't want you to know how smart people are before you hire them. Yeah, which is isn't so that, interesting. Isn't that kind of fucked if you think about yeah, it? You know, every right? other country is like, yeah, that makes sense. You can do it. Yeah. But the US is, is strange. Yeah. I, and, and I get it, but I mean, they'll just get end up getting fired anyway. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but we try not, we, we do our best to like try to filter out people and, exactly. and all that type of stuff. Um, and then, so yeah, talk to me about like when you have these salespeople, I, is, how long is their eval period? Or are you just like, hey, if you, two weeks in, if you're not cutting it, we're letting you go. It depends on the, so mm -hmm. SDR versus closure for the most part. For right? sure. Yeah. And one of the other things too is I personally, once, once you start running a real team, like you mm -hmm. could do this at this point where you're at. Yeah. I don't hire closure straight up anymore. No, we yeah. don't do that. So yeah. that only, was one of the biggest exterior. mistakes, especially with what we've seen like recently, like this like high ticket closer job has become yeah. like it's, a thing now. It's like a plague in the, and I, I'm I known again it. in the sales world and yeah. I was on, I was on podcast yesterday with guys who literally just train sales reps. Uh, and I'm friends with guys who, who that's their program. Yeah. But to, yeah, the closure space of like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a closer. I'm applying to be a closer. I, I don't want to be an SDR that's yeah. beneath me. Mm -hmm. I think it's a terrible, terrible plague in the industry. I agree. And it, it, it's just specifically for the info products too. Cause I know in tech, like, cause that's kind of where I came from. Like you have this like account executives, yeah. right? And like, they, they, they're qualified and they can come in as an account executive, but like these people in these, like they, they go through no, 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 no hate, but yeah. like, I like, cause we, I love Cole Gordon and like, he's yep. like, I got great, great Saw value. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's, like, I mean, he's amazing. Like I have n nothing negative to say. Um, but the, sometimes the people who have that mentality where they, they go through a course, they go through a yeah, recruiting they go thing. Through a course they're expecting to make $15,000 a month after. They exactly. The course, and, and, and it's they like, they and they don't have ex experience. Exactly. And so they churn. So anyway, point is that, yeah. you know, we also are putting everything through everybody through an set SDR yeah. set of role. And now come full circle with our low ticket stuff. A lot of our SDRs are just selling low ticket. And then, yeah. yeah and then so like, and, and the, the, they're getting experience and it's also available for ascensions. Yeah. We still have sets and we still are sending things to our closers, yeah. but uh, it's 
what we're seeing is again, the days of just high ticket booking somebody and selling them $30,000. Yeah. But closures still should be doing the ascensions. Right? I agree. Yeah. And so yeah. closures are doing the ascensions. Cool. So but they're the cool going to the, What yeah. you're doing now is, you know, number one, your closure retention is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. Number two is you're going to only have closures that have the skill of being a setter. So when calendars are slow, they can actually go out and do their own stuff too. The thing about hiring like a direct closure is that yeah, they will just, never do any kind of outbound. Never. Right? Ever. And so you'll have better team camaraderie because they all earned it. That badge of honor thing mm -hmm. is applying to what you're even talking about now. You earn a position as a closer. And I don't know if you do interim stuff, but one thing you should also do is make sure that if they, someone ever earns the right to be a closer, it's an interim position. They have to, in mm -hmm. the first 10 calls, 10 calls is kind of the KPI I would look for. Mm -hmm. Unless it's a bad week for everyone, but ensuring the 10 calls, even if it's a bad week, this still applies. Just are they hovering above the KPI or at the KPI that every other closer on the team is, mm -hmm. right? You know right away someone's going to be good. The, the fall that we all have is that we kind of lie to ourselves and see someone and we're like, ah, oh, I think they can yeah, do it. They, I think they, we can they, get they, them there. Yeah. You know? But within <laughs> within like the first two calls, if you watch the calls, you're going to know right away if someone has it or not. A hundred percent. Or like yeah. have some sort of exactly. ability. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. And the cool part with us too is we do have this middle tier of ticket sales, right? So right. these, like that's like mid ticket. So we have like a... It's almost like a, the JV pro, yeah, like that's cool. where like you can come in. So you have the start, cool kids that are closers. Then yeah. you have like the the the, the, yeah. the, the, the middle of the bus kids. That's cool. and then, yeah. So um, it, it's that's it's not really bad. Smart. Yeah. And, I mean, it just by hap it just kind of happened. Yeah. And but it that's does, how some of the best stuff comes though. Exactly. Like, it just happens. Yeah. And, and so they get a chance. And some of those some of our ticket guys are are making good money. And sometimes cool. some of them just want to stay there because it's yeah. it's a different kind of sale, right? It's like yeah. high volume, very quick, churn and burn type of thing. Yeah, versus the, like, like working one person, going super deep, having those conversations. Yeah, like such. really un uncovering yeah. pain and, you know, all, all the sales stuff. Yeah. Um, That's the other thing too. I talked about this yesterday, but a lot of people think, the other thing about the closure space and the closure programs right now is it makes this, there of course, it's from the software world, like SDR to account exec to VP of sales or, yeah. or sales director, et cetera. Yeah. The, Setting and closing are two very different things in sports. Yes. I know people who are amazing setters that would be terrible closers, vice versa as well. And I know people who would be amazing setters and all they can focus on is wanting to be a closer when in reality they could be doing X and they're really good at like operations, but mm -hmm. they're not focused ops at all. Even though that's what's helping them make money as a setter, they're really good at creating lists and they're really good at, at automating this or whatever. Yeah. They're just like, I want to get on closing calls. Yeah. You know? And so the other thing, if we could ever break a, um, Stereotype, what not stereotype, whatever the a fallacy yeah. in the industry is like just because you're an SDR doesn't mean you have to be a, a closer next, right? I yeah. think that's a really, really common thing. I know we're talking about that ascension and it works a lot of the time, it does play out, but there's also a lot of SDRs. Some of the best hires I've ever made were SDRs that ended up doing completely different things in companies that I was with. Yeah. And you know, like they ended up becoming our data manager or data, like data analyst kind of thing, or they ended up, it was SDR to someone who essentially helped us become an operations guy or SDR to a really common or niche role that no one talks about is you have like copywriters that help with marketing material, mm -hmm. but there's a big difference between mark, marketing copy and then and sales, sales copy, copy. right? Yeah. Sales copy is like the hardest role, role to, to find. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the SDRs that you find that, that crush it are insanely good at sales copy. And it sounds mm -hmm. crazy, but learning how to send text messages that they make people want to buy stuff is not a common thing. SDRs sometimes like that's a really good role that you have. You know, you could you could find people, and so there's so much more than just becoming a closer. Then you know, it's for that sure. Ascension that you can I agree 100. percent So we have people in our own business because you know, like the DM, DMs for us are huge. Yeah. Right. So some of our, like, some of our best setters end up moving over, and they're, they're just in the DMs and they're setting. Yeah. And we have we had people. Um, uh, he's still with us and he started off as an SDR. Then he tried to move into being a closer mm -hmm. for whatever reason, just didn't work out. And then now he's making six figures in our DMS, just, awesome. you know, setting and, you know, d yeah. doing the thing. So but think about how much, yeah. like just a play, right? Mm -hmm. Think of if you took him and said, Hey dude, do me a favor. I want mm -hmm. you to essentially recreate yourself and make SOPs and scripts that allow exactly. you to do it with everyone else mm -hmm. and then do it outbound. So it's not just coming from one account. Right. Yeah. Right? And, that that's when you can start to give. That's such a hard thing to find. It sounds so simple, yeah. But it's like one of the hardest things in sales. That I I feel like I I don't see people often do right. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I would do with setter teams, if you're if you're not, is just text reviews. I know it sounds crazy, but how are you texting people? You yeah, know? I mean, it's definitely like we should do a more formal process. But we are looking, and, and every now and then I'm looking. I'm like. Oh yeah, my gosh! Bad, <laughs> like it's it's bad. And yeah. so I'm like, yeah, all right, you're you're not sending any more text messages, or here, here's here's your template, yep. like just, yeah. just just copy and paste, please. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and it, but I mean, 
it, it's funny some of the things that you got to audit and yeah yeah you know quality assurance when you start to run that's yeah, so yeah, talk to me yeah. more like I know you're mostly on like the the, the sales side and it seems like that's what you've been known for. Um, now, when it comes to like back end ops, yeah. HR hiring, like what are the common mistakes that you're seeing for people like, again, at this like $10 million level? Uh, yeah, that's a broad one. I know like, it's a very broad <laughs> question. Here. I, I can narrow it down a little bit. Cool. So when it comes to like specific you know, people, I see a lot of turnover with, with a lot of these businesses, um, turnover in, in but, 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 you know, we can stay in sales. Well, that's okay. fine. No, um, we, I love backend. We can go to backend, yeah. but let's I mean, say like turnover in employees. Or yeah. Yeah. Turnover in, in employees. Cool. Right. Because they, they might try to scale really quickly and then they got to fire. Yeah. Um, or like, so when it comes to bringing on the right kinds of people, I know we talked about mm -hmm. the, um, the hiring process, but now tell me about like, how do you keep top talent. This is actually, talent. I'd say this is like the one thing that I'm probably, I will say this to boast. I think I'm probably one of the best in the, in not the world, uh, best in the industry at this I love right it. now. Yeah. Um, and what I do, number one, if, if you want actionables, study yeah. guys like Steve Jobs, like Elon Musk, uh, visionaries mm -hmm. that are absolute assholes and, or word dicks, right? Mm -hmm. But still kept the, the best people in the world around them. A good book you can also read is Multipliers by Liz Wiseman. Mm -hmm. But number one is, there's, there's two sides. Number one is a lot of people will bring on people and then realize, oh, this guy doesn't have a lot of work. He's not really doing much. I'm going to let him go, even though they're top tier talent. Uh, and the reason that they're doing that is because I would say 99% of entre entrepreneurs don't, except for salespeople, no one really leverages their people very well, right? Mm -hmm. And so people hire when a majority of their team is only doing 20, 30% of the work that they could do, right? And so one of the, my favorite quotes, it, I'm going to paraphrase it. It's from some random book, mm -hmm. uh, essentially saying it's an employee talking about uh, a director that he had, mm -hmm. right? And he was like, I hate it when that director calls me and says he's looking for somebody because I hate him and I, it, I'm miserable when I'm with him but I do the best work I've ever done in my entire life every single time I'm with him, wow. I think, right? I don't want to, I don't yeah, think yeah. you need to be hated or such. Mm -hmm. I think there's yeah. a fine line, but the point is there are people that find how to bring the most out of people out really well. Mm -hmm. And so one of that is, one of the things I've learned is that, and this sounds so simple, but no one does it. Before you hire, just keep giving work to people. I know it sounds crazy, yeah. but very rarely do you ever get, I don't have bandwidth. I think the, like a really prime example, I had one guy who was like my right-hand man for a long time. And I would give him and give him and give him. And I I would almost use it as a test. And I think in like two two years or just less, he probably said, like, I can't do that right now, like twice. And then I was yeah. like, okay, sweet. Like, I know you're a cap, you're at bandwidth. <laughs> but most most people just underutilize the people that they're with. And so they have teams where their overhead's insane because they have a lot of team members that they don't need to have, uh, even if they are talented team members, uh, all underworked. And the other thing too is people like being busy, right? Yes. I don't like the word busy, but uh, at least challenged and fulfilled mm -hmm. with the work that they're doing. And so if if you're, you know, if you're trying to work eight, 10 hours a day, that's what you want to do in life, but you only have two hours of actual work, you're going to look for something else that can give you more work. For right? sure. And so a lot of people are scared of overworking their team, mm -hmm. especially in like modern day culture. Like everyone's yeah. like, you can't overwork your team. I know you have a point, just give me one. No, 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 I, this is good. Yeah, go. So, but I think realistically, I, I kind of aim to overwork my team because I know people will tell me if I'm overworking them. And yeah. so my goal is like, I will aim to overwork you because I will only find your line by going over your line. And once I go over your line and we both know where the line is, great, I'm going to go under it. I'll probably stay 10% under it. So I know that you're not being overworked. You're not even coming close to that overworking mm -hmm. period. But the only way for me to find that line is by testing that line. Most people never even try to find the line. They're so careful of not overworking people. They're like, ah, you know, I, I need someone else. This guy's probably at, you mm -hmm. know, at top, top end with. That's number one. Number two is entrepreneurs always think that they, entrepreneurs are very money centered for the most mm -hmm. part, impact centered and such, of course, but every business owner for the most part starts a business because they want to make money, right? Mm -hmm. And so they think that other people think the same way, which is a fallacy or like a, a mental perception of virtual, not a virtual reality, a, uh, what's it called with Steve Jobs? A misconception. A misconception, uh, a reality distortion field, right? Uh -huh. That people like us are in, where you think X person is super talented, so they probably wanna get paid a lot of money to come on. So you pay this person a lot of money, and then they leave and you're like, they're, gonna, they're not gonna make that anywhere else. What I have learned is that top tier talented people, really compensation, they look at compensation completely differently. It's money has to make sure that it, it makes sense. They have to be able to, to live the life that they are living, or at least make, you know, make sure mm -hmm. that they're not gonna be stressed or anxious because of cash. But what people that are top tier look for, especially sales reps too, if we wanna bring this to front end, 
they want to be, they want to feel like they're growing. So they want to, they want to be trained. They want to feel like they're being poured into. They want to, you know, especially with info products, with brands, they want to feel like they're learning from you and from Ryan and such, mm -hmm. right? And so how are you pouring into them? Do you have a weekly meeting with your team where they can ask you guys questions just to learn from you? Do you have a weekly meeting where you're using your network to bring in experts for finances or this or this to train your team? Mm -hmm. Do you have a real estate fund that your team can, can invest in so they feel like they're doing something with you and, and, and building with that? Um, are they being challenged every single day by the work that, that you're giving them? Uh, and also that, you know, are, do they have the mission that creates the challenge on its own of mm -hmm. where the company is going and the impact that they're making? Top tier talented people want to make massive impact. The reason that Elon Musk and Steve Jobs brought in the people that they had is because top, like a super smart dude is going to be like, I want to help us get to Mars. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. Right? Most companies, what's your mission, mission statement? Uh, build leaders and enri enrich communities. Okay. Um, so I, like, I love doing mission statement audit audits, yeah. right? So yeah, break the, it down. Yeah. So, okay. So my favorite mission statement is mm -hmm. actually Lego. It's to build and inspire the leaders of tomorrow through play today kind of mm -hmm. thing, right? It's not necessarily the best. I just like it a lot. Yeah. But one thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that it's specific enough for people to actually understand it. Cause that mm -hmm. one sounds good. But when yeah. you, when you hear like build leaders and en en enrich what? Communities. Enrich communities. And reason for that is because, you know, I think with all of our info stuff that we do, like it's truly to help people become leaders in their own lives. Yeah. Right. And then with the enriching communities, we, we have a big like faith kind of, uh, underlying thing. Oh, I, thought, I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm a Christian. I, oh, talk, nice. I try to talk about it in as many oh, podcasts as Yeah, I can. no, so like, uh, yeah. I, you, I know you don't watch Ryan's content, but like, um, you know, a lot of it lately has been, but he's becoming a lot more uh, faith forward. And so, um, and that's our first core value is actually faith. I, um, I love that. Yeah, that's so awesome, it's man. a, and it's like double, double edged where it's like faith in us and the vision and yeah. the, of the company and all that. But then the other side is like, I mean, we, we pray out in meetings and stuff like that too. So anyway, Dude, yeah. uh, we can pray out the podcast. If yeah. you want to. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, um, but any, uh, last thing that I'll say yeah. uh, on that is, um, you know, we have to make sure that like our team, like with the enriching communities, it's more so like, Hey, like how can we bring like faith to the marketplace? And that's like part that. of like, so one of our brands is wealthy kingdom. Um, and it's also, it's like a free Christian entrepreneurship like, yeah. group and all that. But anyway, so I'll, I'll yeah. tell you like a, my personal mission, if you mm -hmm. will, is to essentially use excellency in business to mm -hmm. establish authority that can help me bring people to the kingdom of Christ. Right. I love it. So like business to me is a means to an end to essentially get people to, to have some form of respect for me and then take that respect and say, it's not me. It's, it's God. It's, it's Jesus. And so there's, there's a, a, a a reason I do everything I do. One of the things about yours is like, does your team, how do you enact on your mission? Do you have like a nonprofit that you do? Yep. So that's, that's Wealthy Kingdom. Wealthy Kingdom cool. is our nonprofit. So I, that's really where we're trying to funnel as many people as possible. Um, so I would just say it just sounds like it's good, a good start. I feel like it's, it's incomplete, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, building leaders and enriching communities to do X, right? Got I it. feel like that ju it just needs that second half to yeah. kind of bring it home, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, it's, you know, Building leaders is great, but like, why are you building leaders? Right? Yeah. Enriching communities is, sounds awesome, but like, what's like, the purpose of doing that? What, like, yeah. how is it, I know it sounds crazy to say enriching communities doesn't change the world, but how does it change the world? That's right? huge thing. And so I think realistically, having an amazing a mission, right? And also a vision, what, what's the vision for the company itself? Um, I mean, so that's the vision of the, the higher level company that each individual brand has its own vision, right? Oh. So for example, um, the mission statement of Kingdom, for example, it's... Uh, to, to bring the kingdom to the marketplace. It, okay. It's like, that's like I there. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that, really cool. That, yeah, so that's their, their like specific mission. Um, but mission well, and vision are different. Right? Yeah. So mission so, is the mission of what the company is yeah, going to do. Yeah, and like, what do you want to achieve? The vision, well, yeah. the vision's how you're going to do it. Yeah, Right. Exactly. So like, what's the vision on how you're going to do what, what the, the mission is? Yeah, I, I think, to be honest with you, it's, we don't, tr it's pretty vague because like. See, but the thing is people the, like clarity. You know? I know. And yeah. so the top tier talented people want to know how, think about it this way. Let's say you have a, an operations guy who's super talented, can work at Oracle, Salesforce, wherever he wants in the software world, but he's like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna work with you guys, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, he probably needs to know this stuff before he makes that decision. But number two, let's say he is here. Yeah. Every single day, I'm sorry, how many of your team, how much of your team's remote? Um, not many. Um, the, the, we've, we've been, and it's changed. Like in the beginning, it, I, I actually started remote. I, I yeah. used to live work in San Diego for Ryan. And then cool. I was like, he, he got me out here. But uh, <laughs> good entrepreneurs can do that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes, he's a good sales guy. <laughs> um, but I would say, uh, in terms of the only people who are remote are is a few salespeople that okay. are like, that's legacy. actually okay. So Everybody I'm not else speak is to you, here. Then I'm going to yeah. speak to a majority of people that yeah. majority of teams mm -hmm. remote. Most people, 
are in a home office or even their bedroom with a computer, mm -hmm. just alone outside of team calls, they're alone all day long. And they're creating some kind of, they're coding or they're reading emails or sending out messages, whatever be it. And if you actually think about that, that's really boring, right? And so the whole thing that a vision essentially has to do is, you know, everyone knows the mission, but the mission and the per and the, the nuance of sending out DMs are so far apart mm -hmm. that there's gotta be something that kind of bridges the two, which is the vision of, of essentially what your company is doing, what you're trying to achieve. And then you have to almost have a per team member vision too. Mm -hmm. So I would essentially say, you're sending out messages to do this so that we can do this, so that as a company we can get here, mm -hmm. which is how we how we actually tackle our mission, right? So there's clarity, it sounds crazy, in why DMs actually matter to grow the company outside of us just making money, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to do that with every single role so people understand like, okay, I'm not just coding, I'm doing this because I need to do this so that we can get here. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yeah. And you take top tier people and you make them feel like they're bigger because they are bigger, you make them feel like they are part of a bigger picture For sure. versus just, enriching communities, but not understanding yeah. how their work actually applies to that. I agree hundred percent. And I think we could do a better job internally of, you know, making that a lot more clear, but everybody that works here is it's because they're Christian and they believe in, 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 cool. in, in the other side of the mission, yeah. meaning like, so they, they understand the like truly like wealthy kingdom is really what we're trying to do. So like, for example, at our WealthCon events, for the last two times we do like a service in the beginning. Oh, uh, so yeah, cool. so it's a uh, Ryan. Info. I'd love to. Yeah, on. I will. Uh, Ryan jokes. He call. He makes it a. He's like it's like a bait and switch because it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's like a it's, it's a real estate slash entrepreneurship conference, and all of a sudden, yeah, if the product is good, then you can get away with it. No <laughs> yeah. better product then. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a good product. <laughs> um, cool. So and, and then I guess what other common pitfalls do you see? And this this can be it's a broad question and yeah. it's intentionally broad, like in like just when people are trying to scale their business and uh, it, what else is like the common thing that you see with these businesses you're working with give me like a like what it, we'll say we'll say in, in revenue for uh, uh, somebody who's like in the we'll say like now they're at 20 million and, okay. and they're just, now they're really starting to scale yeah. like what are the big mistakes that they're making so I, I actually i'll use another dan martell thing there are three main blockers that i've seen that dan martell just put numbers on that work really well mm -hmm. in business there's 300, 900, and 2.7, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't see too many people actually like capping at the 20 million kind of mm -hmm. month mark. It's usually um, right around 50, I think, is what people say. That's what I've heard, at least. I'm, I I'm think, not there, I so I think I people know. just pick really fancy numbers, yeah. right? <laughs> but a majority of the time, what happens, if you're if you're capping at, at like 15, 20 million, it's, you, there are a few things you look at. Number one is sometimes you're actually already just capping on market and you have to go a little broader. So the mm -hmm. game becomes like, when you start, you have to do something super niche. I teach sales reps how to go from 5,000 a month in commission to 8,000 a month in commission, right? So it's a B2B offer, you're working with sales reps, B2B, you know, yeah. if you will. Uh, but then, you know, you, let's even make that more niche. I teach high ticket closers how to go from 5,000 a month to 10,000 a month in commissions, whatever yeah. it be. Uh, that's so small, the tame on that is so small that you have to go broader and broader and broader as you start to, to you know, um, become bigger, mm -hmm. right? And so if you're, the first thing is if you're capping, a lot of the time it's your messaging is just a little too niche in order to reach mm. the bigger audience, if you will, that you can compete in. Um, and so that's that's one of the things you can start to look at. There's so many things. Yeah, you know? I know. Um, a lot of the time it's what we talked about where you're like your leverage thing is now your crutch. And so a lot of mm -hmm. companies that are doing, you know, call it 20 mil, they are, there's only two things you can really do. Paid ads or at that, um, two main things that yeah. people do, content and paid ads, right? You can mm -hmm. get into affiliate marketing and stuff like that. But for the most part, you see either someone gets to 20 mil because they're really good at content, but mm -hmm. they shouldn't be at 20 mil. They're just really good at content, so they've gotten away with it. And yeah. so a lot of times it's operational stuff that they have to, to mm -hmm. fill out. Sometimes they're really good at paid ads, but paid ads have massive mm -hmm. diminishing returns. So they get to that point. And because they're doing, even if they have the, you know, the the best closures and stuff with the you don't, how do I word this? If you see someone who's healthily doing paid ads and content and running free stuff to $7 mm -hmm. books to nine, you don't see them capping at 20 mil. Right? Yeah. For the most part, unless mm -hmm. they're, unless they're, you know, struggling to hire people to take on more volume or something like that. Yeah. It, that's a pretty scalable. S scalable spot. Yeah, spot. yeah. Cause you're like well-funded and you're, you're exactly. yeah, you got all the, the ability. That makes sense. And so when it comes to, I, I really like sales teams cause that's like yeah. really like where, no, I don't say where we're, it's our focus right now. Yeah. Um, and like, when it comes to being like a leader within a sales org, like how do you keep people motivated besides like just throwing money at them? There's a lot. To, number one is un, there are like, Tyler Pisic calls it the three M's. There are three things that that drive every mm -hmm. person, for, right? Um, money, mastery, mating. Mm. And so 
Uh, there are a lot of sales reps that you can actually, especially sales reps, because sales reps are egotistical. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are, right? Yeah. So you'd be surprised at how instead of throwing money at them, you can throw a PR article. Hey, we're going to have a PR article written about the top closure this month. Oh, and you're cool. going to see like just different ways, number one, to incentivize, right? Yeah. But number two is, you know, to be cliche, just lead from the front. So I yep. I would take closing calls here and there. And I sometimes didn't close them. It was really yeah. embarrassing. <laughs> you know? I think a lot of people are scared I, to get on closing calls because there's yeah. so much more to lose than there is to gain. For sure. Right? Of like, I don't want everyone to think I'm a dumbass because I'm the one that trains them. I can only lose respect. But I, even, when I, even when I did close them, <laughs> I think they laughed and they just thought like, you know, Paul's just, you know on the battiefield. If you exactly. Will, kind of thing. Yeah. And so I think people respect that too. Cause they, yeah. I, I do the same thing. Like all every now and then I'll hop on calls. It's terrifying. Bro. It is. And it's then so it's so like, much I, I've now. had people like in the room listening while I'm trying to close and yeah. I'm like, Oh geez. Like I, I hope this works. It's so and, much yeah. more pressure on it, you know, <laughs> but it's good. Yeah. Anyway, continue. So th yeah. That's one thing most people don't do. They're just, they don't, they're, they're scared of it and they're not willing to, to mm -hmm. drop it, or they don't recognize the value. Uh, that's one. Number two, man, is I think when I, ran sales teams, the, the thing that really kept people motivated was the amount of training and feedback I gave. It's super time extensive mm -hmm. and time intensive, which is why most people uh, end up scaling out of it, especially when they start running businesses. But imagine if you and Ryan mm -hmm. did a call review for every single sales rep every single day, right? And just said like, hey bro, listen to your call the other day, listen to your call today, uh, thought you did X, Y, and Z really well. One thing I would actually do that I think might help you get a little better is if you do X differently. Mm -hmm. And it a lot of your sales reps are joining, especially info products, because they, they look yeah, up to you guys. Exactly. And when you can give them direct feedback for them, they're like, bro, that's exactly what I came for. And if you just keep that going, it goes mm -hmm. really, it goes, it goes a long way. When you stop doing that, and there's now a disconnect between I came for Javi and Ryan, but I'm not really getting anything from them. I'm mm -hmm. getting something from, from X and X mm -hmm. is cool, but I wanted something from them. That's when you start to see people get a little less happy, a little less motivated. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter how much money you came. It, it's like the expectation of what they came for versus what they're getting mm -hmm. is now different. Money is, of course, a band-aid for that, but it's not the solution. Yeah, I agree. And that's why, we, I mean, and Ryan has, and we, we've noticed this, like I'd probably say the two previous years, he wasn't as active in the business as yeah. like he probably could have been. He was just creating content, focused it's on really other stuff. Yep. And then also we, we started doing like portfolio companies. So we started partnering with people and, and do, doing a bunch of other stuff outside of just info. Um, and then this last year, uh, Ryan's like, you know what? Like I should be spending more time with the team, yeah. with the sales reps and all that. And so it, it's been a lot more helpful. I'm sure you he's can not feel doing, the energy difference. Oh, too. for sure. And I mean, he's not doing call reviews. Like I'll still do some of those here yeah. and there. Uh, Cause we have sales managers and leadership that yeah. like but handle even, a lot bro, of it. Even, but even yeah. Ty still does one or two a day. Yeah. For, which is wow. Really? Yeah, bro. It just, it doesn't, you don't, okay. Here's what most people think a call review is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit down listen to your 45 minute call, spend an hour with you, go through every single part of it. Here's how you can do it scalably. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to know within five minutes of 2x speed on your call, I'm going to find something that you're going to fuck up on. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to say, bro, you did X, Y, and Z well, do this differently. And it's going to take five minutes of my day. And if I have a team of three closers, five mm -hmm. closers, 10, whatever it is, I can bang that out pretty quickly and people yeah. feel really recognized. Call reviews don't have to be super Like the intense. super long thing. Exactly. Yeah. The main, like the whole thing is, did you not close the deal? Great. Did they come in looking like they were closable? Where did the discrepancy come from then? That's mm -hmm. all you have to look for, right? Yeah. And so- I would argue realistically that you can you can do more than you think when you realize like it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the full thing it just has to be a little nugget to you know just to show yeah. that you do care and that you are there for them. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, yeah, and that last part that you just mentioned, I think is the most important. No matter how you do it, obviously call reviews are great because they actually improve and they get better. Yeah. But as long as you prove that you care and that you do take a vested interest in that person, exactly. I think that goes so far. Agreed. So I, I love that. Well, what last question here before I let you go? If you had to leave the earth tomorrow, Ooh. what's one thing you'd want people to know? That I was with Jesus, genuinely. Uh, and, uh, cliche, mm -hmm. corny, but yeah. at the end of the day, I, I know 100% that I've, if I left the earth tomorrow, I will be at the pearly gates, you know, yeah. with Christ and smiling. That is one of the better answers we've had. So <laughs> I will leave it at that. And dude, thank you so thank much. You so me. valuable. Thank you, bro. Cool. I appreciate it.